wanted to have a conversation because I think uh, for all of us, uh, wisdom has touched our lives in, in a pretty profound way. Um, and at the same time, we've kind of lived what it means to navigate our practices and our beliefs in the context of our work and our life. Um, and this has been a journey that has been for many of us as long as wisdom has been uh, around. And so I wanted to start off um, by uh, asking everybody if you could say a little bit about yourself and then um, talk about sort of what you found as, as a challenge in, in bringing sort of your practice or your full self into your work life. Um, and then, actually, I've asked everybody to ask a question of the group, and so this is my question, and then we'll, uh, I think Bradley or whoever will go next. So. Who would you like to go first, Artro? I think Bradley will go okay. first. Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> um, I'm Bradley, and um, I'm a longtime meditator for about 30 years, and I'm a tech executive. I've worked at Google for about the last decade. Um, the way that I came into wisdom was um, Soren did a cold outreach to me and asked me if I would like to support this thing he was doing. And um, not much more detail was available than that. <laughs> uh, but uh, it was enough that I felt intrigued and um, really felt the purity of his intent. And, uh, as a curator and shepherd, he was able to sort of hold this space of opportunity without sort of imposing any agenda on it, which I thought was amazing. I just love that kind of leadership, and it's a delicate art to sort of be open and um, not completely passive, but, but sort of to just hold that space. And I thought he was just masterful at how he did that. And so I agreed to help support I think it was the unconference portion of the very first Wisdom Conference, which is 10 years ago. And um, I very generously volunteered Google's resources. I'm always <laughs> available to give away somebody else's stuff. Um, but I should mention that um, I don't say yes to uh, every inbound request. I want to make that very clear uh, <laughs> at this moment. But. Um, got very much bitten by the bug that has bitten us all and has brought all of you here, which is really the um, safe and loving and curious space that Soren has created here, and it's just been a joy to watch that evolve over the years. Um, in terms of a challenge I have about bringing my full self to work, um, I do see so much opportunity in work to uh, work on myself and to, to bring the practices. I mean, there's never a moment or interaction or day that goes by without many, many opportunities to um, bring that fullness of myself in there. And so uh, I felt like very, very blessed to have an opportunity to do that in very, very subtle ways. So I remember recently we were talking about um, bringing meditation into the workplace. And the sharing that came up for me in that session was that it was less about bringing candles and gongs and incense and you know, moments of silence, and much more about listening and creating safe space for people to share, non-judgmental, you know, just as we observe our own thoughts flying by, you could listen to other people's opinions and not necessarily react or get attached and things like that. So that the opportunity was really to practice in a way that no one would notice, um, at least overtly. Um, I caught a little bit of the previous speaker sharing so much about embodying uh, as opposed to teaching or in addition to teaching. And so for me, that's a lot of what it's been is sort of just uh, the opportunity to do the inner work in that great part of our day that is our work life. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> oh, I, I left out the most important part. I'm Irene's husband. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm his wife. Hi, I'm Irene. And um, so the, we're to introduce ourselves and then talk about our relationship to wisdom 
A little bit, just to see how you got connected with the um, So, um, I am a yoga teacher, I'm a designer, I work at a venture capital firm, I'm a former Googler, so I used to work with all these guys, a former Yahoo, where I used to work with both of these guys. Um, I think that uh, where you have common interests and common friends, um, the paths kind of lead to the same road, and so that's kind of how I got connected to the Wisdom 2.0 community, and um, have spoken here um, throughout the years about the relationship between design and the self and our inner spirit and maybe even led a few yoga practices here as well. Um, in terms of challenges around bringing um, the full self into the workplace, um, uh, this was definitely a big struggle for me um, when I worked at Google during a time where my kids were very young. I think they were three and six and my entire team um, I don't think anybody else really had that many children, and so um, I was like this old person who had kids. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, and, and uh, it was a little bit, it was almost embarrassing to be a working mom because I could feel like a skepticism that people had around me and whether I could be effective um, because I wasn't fully there because I also had these kids and I had to make their lunches and drive them to school and things like that. Mm. Um, and uh, this is also, during a period of, t of time when um, it was very difficult for me personally and professionally, just advancing design at Google um, was not an easy task. Um, so uh, all of that really led me to deepen my practice. That was the way that I could cope um, with the physical pain that I was experiencing as well as the emotional suffering, um, going through divorce at the same time and things like that. I feel like um, now that I'm older and kind of on the other side of it, um, I really don't see any separation between um, myself and the completeness of who I am and coming to work. Um, and uh, I felt some insecurity around it at first when I entered the world of venture capital five years ago. Like, would people take me seriously? In fact, one of the headhunters that I spoke with was like, so what's the deal with you being a yoga teacher? Like, can you really join a venture capital firm and be taken <laughs> seriously? It's like, you know, I actually think that that's what makes me more effective. And that's why some of the entrepreneurs are drawn to working towards me. And I can see more clearly what's getting in the way of um, what they need to do. And I can coach them more effectively through those issues. So I really don't see this separation between um, who I am and bringing that to work. I think it's, I embrace it. And I think that's actually led to uh, me being more effective and, um, and, and just enjoying work more, more wholly as a result. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I'm Karen May, and happy to be here this evening with my friends, who I would not necessarily have if it were not for Wisdom 2.0. So that would be one form of connection, is just the relationships that formed out of doing this together for so many years. Um, my connection here started at the second conference, and basically Soren says, Karen, would you interview someone at the conference? And I say, sure, who? And he says, I'll let you know. <laughs> and then he does, and then I say, what do you think it would be useful to talk about? And he's like, it'll emerge. <laughs> so kind of reinforcing what you've heard a little bit. And it always does emerge, and it's... Um, a privilege that I really value. And so that has been my connection here, and I am very grateful for this intersection of technology and mindfulness. And um, when I first would tell people about it, technology and mindfulness, they were very um, confused, like really confused. But now it's not so confusing anymore, and um, so that's exciting, that's progress. The, to the question about what's difficult um, I, I think I bring most of myself to work. I feel lucky, and in a sense, like Irene said, as I've gotten older, the difference between me at work and me not at work, um, those differences are um, pretty minimal at this point. And I'd say the one thing I notice is I'm always really curious of when, like, if something's stuck and 17 different people have a view on it, I wish I had time to actually understand all of it and t more time for my curiosity and space for understanding the system. And 
um, I often don't have time for that. So in that sense, I don't get to authentically explore the full view. Sometimes things just have to get decided and done. Um, but all in all, I feel like I get to show up as, as me, and um, I'll take the consequences. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Gopi, and for the last 12 years or so, I've worked as a bricklayer in a small internet company called Google, where I've had the pleasure, privilege, and honor of working with all these amazing beings, Karen, Irene, and Bradley. And over the 12 years I've been coming to and speaking at Wisdom, it's uh, incredible to see what a big movement it has grown into, led by a small team, mm -hmm. and obviously uh, Soren at the helm, and Soren deserves a lot of credit for having this vision. So first of all, let's applaud the 10th anniversary with a big round of cheering for sure. But what you may not know about the history of wisdom is there was one person who almost killed it. And in the interest of recognizing, acknowledging, and inclusivity, we should talk about that. And that person was me. <laughs> Because 11 years ago, Soren came and had lunch with me at, uh, at Yoshka's uh, cafe at Google. His book had just come out, and he said, I'm thinking about organizing this conference, and I want to know what you think. I told Soren, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I said, these two worlds won't intersect. You'll never get the tech community to sit with the wisdom people and have a conversation, and you're taking a big risk by booking a whole venue. And so maybe try a small meetup for one afternoon with 20, 30 people and see how it'll all gel. Soren, because he has infinite wisdom, ignored me completely and went ahead and booked the Computer History Museum, 400 seats and filled every single one. And then he moved it to a bigger venue with 1,000 people, it sold out. Then he moved it to 4,000 person venue and it sold out. And every year, now it's spread to other cities, London, New York, etc. So the moral of the story is, if you have a great idea you want to execute on, whether it's a company or a venture, please come and talk to me, listen carefully, and do the exact opposite. <laughs> because in 10 years, I've come to the humbling realization that in this forum, or when I'm at work at Google, I'm the least wisest person in any room. <laughs> So my connection with wisdom tradition started, I was growing up in India, so as I say, I won the ovarian lottery and was born into a culture <laughs> where these traditions were a big part of our life. So in my teen years, I met my guru who taught me in a traditional way. She taught me how to meditate and put me on a path. And I ran away from home to live in an ashram, the Shivananda ashram, to become a yoga teacher early on. And at that time, the Lululemon yoginis had not taken over the scene. <laughs> and I say this with great love. It was, still <laughs> it was still taught by bearded men in orange. But it was a very traditional kind of thing. You had to be, even within the Indian context, you were considered a little eccentric to go pursue this very esoteric path of um, personal wisdom and practice. But it's morphed to such an extent. So when I arrived at Google, I started a yoga program for the Googlers called Yoglers. Uh, it was one class with one product manager with a conference room with a few chairs moved away. And that program has now grown to more than 250 classes a week. It is the largest yoga program in the world, or one of the largest. And I could not have imagined that this would scale in this fashion. Um, although along the way, one thing that does, is troubling me is that as it continues to spread, we, the movement sort of whitewashes and dilutes the original practice and gets packaged in easy or more broadly acceptable marketing terms like mindfulness, and it moves further and further from the tradition. So unlike what Bradley said, I am trying hard to push it in that direction. So last Monday when I taught the class, one of the CEOs of the Google member company, she was there, she comes pretty regularly to the Monday yoga class. I actually lit candles, I lit incense, <laughs> and I played Kirtan music, and I said, I, let's try and keep the tradition as much as possible to this authenticity, and we don't have to be apologetic about it, we don't have to be uh, embarrassed about it. And along those lines, I said something like traditional Kirtan singing, 
let's give it a try. So we got Krishna Das to come and sing at Google. Mm. And that would be my challenge to this community as you look at the next 20 years. We are drawing upon 2,000 year old traditions going back all the way up to you know, the birth of Buddha and uh, keep the original traditions intact. There's a reason they've stayed with us and as it continues to morph and go into the tech world, there is no reason to dilute it or shy away from the original teachings. So I think when we were talking about this, had this um, we would have time for lots of questions, and I don't think we do. <laughs> um, so any, mini, my name, or Irene. <laughs> what question do you have for? What Austin? question do I have? Mm -hmm. Well, I was reflecting on what this conference means to me and this community. Um, it's one of my favorite conferences that I attend a year. I go to a lot of conferences too. Um, but by the end of the weekend, it always feels like um, everyone leaves so open hearted um, and connected and filled with love in a way that is just. Um, you know, like you don't get the same feeling at any other conference. Um, and uh, one of the things that I think is so special is the community. And every time I see friends from this community, it brings me back to the practice. It brings me back to this place. And, um, and so it, I guess the question I have for each of us to contemplate and for us to reflect on is like, how do we keep that going within our own personal lives and our communities? How do we cultivate that sense of community um, within our immediate circles and maybe even extending beyond? I was so uh, inspired by what Michelle has been doing um, with the, the National Forest Service and then extending beyond. Um, it's like, how do we uh, cultivate more community and greater connection with each other um, within the wisdom community and then outside and beyond? <coughs> I'm going to just hold that question for a moment, because um, I think everybody here is sort of exploring that, that question, and that's one of the reasons we're called to be here. Mm -hmm. um, I think for myself that um, in, in, in the time I was at, at Facebook, um, I, I realized that um, the thing that I could do that was of greatest service would be to um, give people tools to better be in connection and uh, relationship with each other. Um, and I'm very grateful that uh, my life partner and love shares that same intention and hope. And so kind of beginning the journey of, of I think for me, the practice has always centered around compassion and community and connection. And, and, uh, and I hope to begin a journey which will be a lifetime one of figuring out how you nurture that uh, for the people who would like to have that in their lives. Mm -hmm. Irene, I'll share a, a, a less uh, theoretical, how about that, super practical tactic that I use. Um, I was in a class probably 10 years ago and a woman advised writing a thank you note every Friday morning to someone, oh, I like that. someone who'd done something or someone that you appreciated. And I don't always write a thank you note, but I try on a pretty regular basis either to thank someone or to tell them why I love them or to reach out to them if I know that they're suffering mm -hmm. in like a sentence or a three word text or sending them a heart or telling someone um, who might not know what I love about them, why, um, why they're special to me. So I, I try to sort of take some, um, take some proactive steps around connection to my community slightly more broadly than my most intimate community. Um, and so far, I've never been rebuffed. <laughs> so <laughs> I think there's, it's just sort of trying to acknowledge the humanity that we all experience and recognizing how easy it is um, just to get busy and not do that. Mm -hmm. So that's my sort of practical strategy for trying to keep some of that beautiful sensation that we walk away with here on Sunday evenings. Um, 
I like that. Thank Going. You. Thank you. That reminds me that um, another insight that I had that really inspired me, there was actually a, a contemplation that asked, what inspires you? And what came up for me, we talk a lot these days about microaggressions in the workplace and things mm -hmm. like that. There are also micro compassions out yeah. there. And I love just watching a stranger hold the door open for another stranger, eye contact over an exchange or transaction. Like, if you look around and have an eye for it, there's all this sort of subtext mm -hmm. of connection happening in the world as well. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And you can tune into that vibration as well. And I think one of the nice things about the wisdom community is it's very inclusive and the boundaries are fuzzy and sort of ripple out into the world. There's no membership card, like you are now a certified wise guy or, you know, <laughs> um, it, like whatever level of affiliation you want to have with this group is welcome. And um, I think that's one of the most beautiful things about it, that it sort of operates in the same spirit that Soren does everything, mm -hmm. which is out of love and inclusivity and, and welcome. Micro kind of kindnesses. By the way, you know, we invited Soren to join us, and I take the fact that he's not here as complete license to talk about him as much as <laughs> we want to. He's 10 feet away behind us, so mm -hmm. we do need to be careful. <laughs> <laughs> um. So after I did want to throw out a question out there. So you know, given that this conference explores the intersection of technology and wisdom traditions, so on the one hand, all of the technologies that have happened in the same period, the last 10 years, uh, has been pretty phenomenal. So if you just look at how humans now navigate you know, getting from place A to place B. 10 years ago, we did it very differently. Now the fact that the entire map of the world we carry in our pocket, and I could drop you off into Zagreb, Croatia, and you'll find your way around. It's remarkable, the empowerment. And yet, in some levels, on many days, I go into work thinking, am I building weapons of mass distraction? Mm -hmm. And it takes away from attention and human connection. And yet, these wisdom practices have taught me that it is not the fault of the technology. Those are inner things. It is our relationship to it and how do we reframe the relationship? And how are we going to first start doing that ourselves? And uh, how are we going to then spread it to the rest of, mm -hmm. will the world figure this out for itself? Like the way we understood how to establish a relationship with fire over the years. Mm -hmm. So we can contain it and use it safely because we've learned that if we are careless with it, as the previous speaker talked about, we could burn a whole city down. Yeah. <laughs> I would say that I think there, there, I believe that I kind of agree and disagree. I agree from the perspective that we definitely it's important to have, be aware of our relationship to technology and work on that, and all of us need to do that. I also, uh, for all of us who have worked or work on those things, I think there's the interesting question to explore about like what does the practice of compassion mean in the products that you're building, um, and in particular, uh, how do we build things in such a way that they bring people closer to each other? Um, and that can be done, and it's, I think, a responsibility of all of us who, who live in this space. So the question I wondered about, it's not really a question, it's more of a contemplation, is really over the 10 years since we have been gathering like this, there has been a giant pendulum swing, and it's hard to remember, such a distant memory, but 10 years ago, technology was so optimistic that this was going to be the means by which the world came together and gave people voice and spread opportunity, and it was a time of innocence and naivete <laughs> and, and optimism, and now we've seen the pendulum swing all the way to the other side. Um, where we can see some of the devastating consequences of tech addiction and or fake news and all of these things. And so it's a moment of great pessimism. And sort of um, being a little bit older, this has been a theme of uh, our <laughs> talking up here. Um, I'm teaching a class right now to graduate students and um, my co-instructor and I realized that they're 25 years old and had never seen an economic downturn 
you know, that they had grown up in this sort of up and to the right uh, boom time and have never seen a pendulum swing about what happens when businesses contract and the economy contracts and the change in mood and things like that. And so thinking about that swing of the pendulum, what has come up for me is really I remain optimistic and not optimistic that everything's okay now. Um, it's more of a meta-optimism. I, rem I remain optimistic that irrespective of whether things are going well or going poorly, as that swings back and forth, that there's something else, something deeper, um, a frame around all of it. Um, and as you said, I think we will learn together how to get through this as well. So I do think things are, are very complicated and challenged right now, but I also think we will find our way through it. So, so if I may ask in, in closing, because we're out of time, and ask each of you to weigh in on this. Um, what do each of you think is something that should be nurtured or tended to in order to facilitate that swing back? I was struck, Arturo, by um, the founder of All Sides earlier this evening who shared that visual that we saw of you know, the same story and what it looked like told from the right, from the left, and from the center. And you could see at all at one time three different sort of interpretations of the same event. And, and I thought that's an interesting kind of teaching device to teach perspective taking. And that if we were able to use technology to help people, um, we're, we're in the bubbles that we're in, but if you use technology to help people recognize it's a perspective, and here are some others, and they're readily available to you, that I, there was something about that that made me think um, there's some opportunity for us there in terms of how we, can, how we can learn and how we can teach more perspective taking, critical thinking, and then connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would summarize in one word as simply practice. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is we are privileged that the solution for this has already been figured out by other human beings over the years. So the operating manual, they handed it to us through these various lineages and teachings mm -hmm. and traditions that exists, whether it's yoga or meditation or chanting or ceremonies, our responsibility is simply to pick whatever pieces that work for us and practice. So return back to that life raft of a blue mat or your cushion, the life vest of a cushion, and practice. I think that um, we've somehow lost the ability to listen to each other. There's a lot of otherizing and kind of digging into this is who I am, my identity, my affiliation. Uh, the internet kind of made that um, able to happen. You know, it's like with GeoCities was the first iteration and then eventually Facebook was like, oh, you could find your tribe. But that tribalism leads to otherism. And so I, I think the invitation is to um, find ways to reconnect and, and listen to each other. I think that when communication is mediated through a screen, um, we, it makes it even more possible to dehumanize each other because the voice is now suddenly just text on the screen. We don't see the other person. Um, so I'd like to see how we can kind of cultivate, again, more in-person community, more connection in person, and more listening. I think that's how we get to the other side. <laughs> But at least can you take us home? Um, I want to celebrate your work. And I know of no other example that shows how compassion can be married to technology than the work you did while you were at Facebook. Um, and I still admire and find inspiration in that. And it's well documented, fortunately. So it's something you can look up. Um, so I'm very optimistic that it is possible to marry these things, not just in one's personal practice, but in a way that can influence the products and then billions.
Yeah. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.